Hello, everybody, and welcome to Aging with Expectation. So today's topic is around the art of seeing and being seen, you know, strengthening our connections. And I'd like to welcome Reverend Dr. Stephen Kosky from the First Presbyterian Church in, in Bend in Oregon, who will be um, leading this discussion today. And I'm Catherine von Troyer from the Cam Miller Institute. So welcome to this discussion. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting wherever we are. In Australia, we, we pay our respects to elders past and present and Aboriginal elders and other communities who may indeed be listening to this. And we extend this respect to all Indigenous peoples from around the world and to any First Nations people who may come across the material that we're presenting today. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. And as always, uh, what a pleasure to have this opportunity to share a conversation with you. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge um, with deep, deep gratitude uh, the life and legacy of, of Dr. Francis McNabb, because he he began this program. Um, and the pro program continues not only in memory of him, but as an effort to continue his legacy and a recognition of the many, many lives and relationships that he has impacted uh, in his life. So the topic is connections and how to how to build stronger and, and deeper connections, the art of, of seeing and also being seen. And I want to begin with a story. Um, I, I love golf. I'm a I'm a mad keen golfer. And so I was 16 years old and it was hole number seven. And it was about 170 yards. Well, I'm doing quick math here. I think that's 187 meters, something like that. Um, and I hit a perfect six iron. It bounced twice and went in the cup. Now, from a golfer's perspective, this is this is the pinnacle. This is the highest point of life. Now, I should have been absolutely overjoyed, jumping up and down dancing and in fact it was actually one of the lowest points of my life um one of the most awkward points of my life it just one that just kind of took the air out of me because i was by myself and and even as i tell the story now people said sure you got a hole in one but i had this event which should have been this momentous event then i turned and there was no one to share it with and somehow not having someone there to see, to be seen, to share in this celebration, to share in this moment, actually robbed uh, the meaning from this particular event. So it kind of reminds me that that life really is meant to be lived in relationship. Life is really meant to be lived in in community. That that we are really uh, social animals. The longest study on happiness, uh, apparently the longest study, I'm not quite sure where to begin, but it was the, the longest study at Harvard University. It's called the study on human development, but it was really the study on happiness. And what this study showed was that the number one factor uh, determining a sense of joy, satisfaction, um, peace, fulfillment in life. The number one factor that determined whether someone was happy or not was the quality of their relationships. So the quality of life equals the quality of our relationships. And I think the quality of our relationships really equals the quality of our connections. You know, do we feel connected? Do we feel do we feel seen and do we see one another? So it's really funny because of, because of these, these, whoops, can't see that, these smartphones. Um, one could argue that we've never been more connected now than ever. I mean, how amazing it is that you, there you are in Melbourne, Australia. Here I am in Bend, Oregon. For me, it's Thursday afternoon or something. And for you, I'm guessing it's Friday sometimes. Um so how extraordinary, because 
in many ways, it feels like we're just sitting next to each other, uh, able to see each other and have this conversation. So we've never been more connected. But I know at least in America, and I'm in a moment, I'm going to really I'm be very interested to hear what the situation is on Australia. But in America, even though we've never been more connected, um, I would argue, and many would agree with me, there's never been a time where we've been more disconnected, where we've been never been more divided, um, where people feel uh, invisible, uh, unseen. So America right now, as one writer described it, that America is fractured and living in a quiet crisis of disconnection. And I think that's a pretty accurate description from my observation. 54% of Americans in a recent survey, 54% of Americans report that no one knows them really well. Meaning they might have superficial relationships, but there's no one that knows them really well. I mean, how I understand that, what they're really saying is, no one really sees me. They might have they, they might see the labels they have for me. They might have assumptions about me. They might have judgments about me. But they don't really see me. That's more than half of the population. I mean, you can be in a marriage, I think, and not feel seen. You can be part of, of a community like a, a church community. That my particular church community, we have uh, several hundred people that gather on a Sunday morning. You can be part of that gathering and feel completely invisible. The number of people in America right now who say that, that, that they have no close personal friends has quadrupled in the past two decades. Mm -hmm. That over 60% of Americans, I just, I just staggers me, the implications of this statistic. Over 60% of, of adults in the United States report feeling lonely. And I was actually really surprised by the, um, by the demographic that feels the loneliest. If you would have asked me, I probably would have said the elderly. But the demographic that actually feels the loneliest are 18 to 22 year olds, which is really fascinating. And the Surgeon General of the United States, who actually just wrote a book on loneliness, uh, Vivek Murphy, he said, uh, loneliness is as harmful to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And there's one really side note that I want to just wonder about for a second. Um, what I've observed in America is people are people are, are becoming more and more angry. <laughs> they're, they're, and there's 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 a meanness, a, a meanness of spirit that kind of is this undercurrent. Uh, gun violence is in epidemic proportions. And I was thinking about that, and and to me, violence happens when you're suffering has no place to go. So if people are feeling invisible, if people are feeling unseen, if, if, if people are in pain and they don't feel seen or heard, um, it's not surprising that that gets lashed out, maybe with angry driving or short tempers in conversations. So one in five Americans report that they really don't have anyone to talk to about really important matters. So the study in Harvard would suggest that a deep basic need as a human being, a need for us to thrive, a need for us to be emotionally healthy, a need for us to be happy, is to belong, is to be seen, is to have deep connections. And at least in America, 
well more than half of the people are saying, I feel disconnected. I feel invisible. Um, I feel alone. What's the situation like in Australia? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I, I actually think our statistics are really similar to, to what they are in, in America. That in, in Australia, one in four people report each week that they feel lonely. And one in two report that they either feel sometimes or always feel alone. So it's quite significant. It's quite a high number, but very similar. And then 54% of people also report that they were lonelier following the pandemic, of which we also had quite a lot of lockdowns, particularly in Victoria in Melbourne, Australia. But um, but 54% um, of people feel lonelier after the COVID pandemic crisis and um, than what they used to. So it, it suggests to me that th this is an emerging problem that's getting larger. So it would seem to me um, not only for the individual health of each person, it would seem for the health of our communities to focus on, well, how can we connect? I mean, how can we build stronger connections? Um, so I want to suggest five ways that just might help us lean into stronger connections um, for ourselves and perhaps how we might help other people feel connected. And I have five L's. <laughs> um, I've learned a lot from Dr. McNabb. He was always big at alliterations and there was always at least five, I remember. Um, so I think we need to look, I think we need to listen. I think we need to lower our, our armor. I think we need to pay attention to the, to the little moments. And lastly, I think we need to lift each other up more. So I want to start with, with look and just this, this basic idea that the human soul has a need to be seen. I really think the human soul has a need to be seen, a deep need. I think one of our deep basic needs as human beings is to be seen, heard, valued, and affirmed. I don't think uh, the soul, I don't think desires to be fixed. <laughs> I don't think it desires to be converted. I don't think it desires to be controlled. Um, which is often kind of our approach to one another, just simply to be seen. I often say there are two needs that every human being has. And if we kind of are organized, like in our organizations, if we organized ourselves around these two needs, everyone has a need to be valued and everyone has a need to be valuable. I often think if schools thought about that, you know, how can we make sure that every single child feels valued? And how can we find a way that they feel valuable, that they feel important? So I think there's a fundamental question, just a simple question that I think can actually shift relationships. And that simple question is, do people feel important, valued, seen in your presence? There is this wonderful story out of Northwestern University about a philosophy professor who was giving a test on the meaning of life. And so you had to, you had to, each question was, what's the meaning of life through the lens of Plato or Aristotle or Socrates? And, and the students were busily answering these questions. And it got to the last question, question number 10. It was an, it was a class, it was an evening class at, at six o'clock every evening. And the last question was, what's the name of the woman who cleans our classroom? There was a woman who was there every evening when the students would gather, uh, finishing up the cleaning. So she was there every evening. And the students were like, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, we get your point, but this won't count for our grade, will it? And this professor said, actually, the first nine questions don't count for your grade. The 10th question is the actual test. And, and her name, um, her name is Amelda. She's a single mom of two. 
And this this evening cleaning job is her third job because she's trying to put her kids through school. Her story is incredible, and she's a person worth knowing. And I often think of that story is, is, is uh, particularly someone like Imelda, who cleans, she would have felt invisible. All of these students, I mean, for a whole semester, would have come and, and saw her, but not really see her. Now that's the woman who cleans the school, but I think those that same reality sometimes happens with people we live with in families or people we work with in organizations that that they're there, but we don't really see them. And again, in America, more than half of the people say that no one knows them really well. I've been doing a lot of reading. I've just been really fascinated on the connection between the brain and spirituality. And uh, I was just reading a book recently where neuroscientists ha have discovered that the part in your brain that is most impacted by trauma is healed or at least starts to heal when you connect to a community where you can tell your story, where you can weep, where it's safe to weep. So in other words, the part in your brain, and we all experience trauma, I don't think there's anybody who would listen to this who has not experienced the trauma of life in some way. And the part in your brain that is most impacted by trauma begins to heal if someone sees you in such a way that you can tell your story about that trauma and they don't necessarily try to fix you. They just provide a safe space uh, for you to be, for you to be seen. Uh, I was also reading um, Iris Murdoch. Do you know Iris Murdoch? She's a, a British Scottish philosopher and, and author. And she actually just wrote a book on um, how to pay attention. And, and in her book, in the research that she has done, she says that um, how we attend to others with our eyes communicates far more powerfully before we even open our, our mouths to speak. Um, so she talks about, you know, whether you actually see, see someone. So what she will sit, what she says is what she has found. And, and you can tell that you can tell when you're in the presence of someone, I think, and they're not really present to you. And you can tell when you're in the presence of someone and they're really present to you. And she says, that's your eyes that do that, that, that your eyes communicate powerfully before you even open your mouth. So it's a really an interesting question just to simply ask, um, do we look, do we see, do we pay attention? Uh, Iris Murdoch says, you know, we can look through, we can look through critical eyes. And if we look through critical eyes, what we will see are faults, what we will see are flaws. We can look through fearful eyes and what we will see is threat. Or we can look through kind eyes and, um, and if we look through kind eyes, the other person will feel that kindness and will feel seen. There's an author I love by the name of C.S. Lewis, who says that if we, um, if you, if you all of a sudden had never met a human, you've never encountered a, uh, a, another human being in your entire life. And all of a sudden you encountered another human being. He said, you would be amazed. You would be so fascinated that you would regard this creature as a miracle. And you'd want to know, know more about what this, what this creature is all about. So imagine if we treated everybody that way. I mean, everybody has a story. Everybody has a unique story. Um, everybody has, has something that's worth knowing.
if we can get past the labels and the judgments and the assumptions and just treat every person we meet with curiosity, um, I think that would make a difference. What are your thoughts on that, Catherine? You raised some really interesting um, issues, I think, Stephen, and it, and it makes me reflect a little bit about actually where I grew up. And I grew up in, in very rural Victoria in, in a farming area. And, and I remember a lot of country folk often have the reputation of city folk, of, of being busybodies and in everybody else's business. But there's actually some safety and some, some security with that. And um, and and I grew up, you know, the town was the village in a way. And um, and often people's aunties or uncles lived up the road or on neighbouring farms and things. So there was that much stronger connection. Although I take your point that sometimes that connection cannot be as strong as what it could ideally be. But I remember when I first came to Melbourne and hearing a story about somebody who was in Perth and sadly they'd actually deceased and despite all their mail building up over an 18 month period, no one said anything. And so for 18 months, this person very sadly had deceased and was still in their public housing unit there. And I remember at the time thinking, I, I just don't understand. How does that happen? Why didn't the neighbour or someone go and knock on their door? Because in the country, that's what we would have done. You know, if someone's struggling, you cook something and you take it around. And I think it really says something about the way that society shifted. You know, we've become nuclear families. We don't do the multi-generational living anymore. And so there's factors that have occurred around us that um that, that we we can't influence but we can influence coming back to your point Stephen what we do and then doing some purposeful looking and just looking out for people yeah um, so just a reflection there yeah well, I really appreciate that and even a simple question do we know our neighbors mm. and uh and how important that is mm. and the other thing is is you triggered for me um just paying attention. Because one of the things, one of the differences that have happened, I, I held up my cell phone a, a little while ago. And I'm amazed how many conversations I have where people don't really pay attention. You know, that all it takes is a ding on a phone. And some and in that instant, their their attention turns from me to the phone. Uh and I think that makes that I don't I think we underestimate the impact of that. Um, I think these connections, again, the quality of life equals the quality of our connections. I think if we we I I I would say it treat attention as an all or nothing, um, where our total focus of our attention as if there's an on and off switch with no dimmer. And when we're on, we're on, um, as opposed to on until I'm distracted. Um, so imagine if we really uh, considered that with our conversations with one another, total attention and president, presence, as if we have an on and off switch. Well, for now it's on. And while I'm with you, it's gonna stay on until we're done and then I'll turn it off. Um, I think that would that would profoundly uh, transform some relationships because it relates to the second L, which is listen. Um, I don't think we can really listen unless we're totally present. Um, Dan, Mc, Dan uh, McAdams teaches at Northwestern University. And I don't know why I'm on, I, the seminary I went to was affiliated with Northwestern. So that's why all these Northwestern stories are coming out. Um, I went there for a while. Um, and he studies, he has classes and he studies how people narrate their life stories. So he invites people um, to come and over a four hour period, he just simply asks them to tell their story. So he just simply asks them, tell, you know, tell me, Tell me the high points in your life. Okay, tell me some of the low points in your life. What have been some of the turning points in your life? Over a four-hour period, tell me your story. 
And then when that four hours is over, he hands them a check to compensate. Well, one thing he always says, inevitably, with every person, at some point in the four hours, there are tears. And then he hands them a check to compensate for their time. And he says, almost all of them try to hand me the check back. And they say, this has been one of the best afternoons of my life. Because no one, no one ever asked me to tell, asked me to tell me, to tell them about my life story. So in other words, no one really asked me about my life story. No one ever gives me the opportunity to tell my life story. I mean, there's this beautiful thing, I, probably in Australia as well, this beautiful, I think it's called Storybook, where you can give, particularly your, your elderly relatives, maybe your grandparents, parents, um, you give them questions, like open-ended questions that invite them to, you know, what are your high points? What are your low points? What are your turning, turning points? And um, they write all of that down, and this this company actually turns it into a book. Um, so it becomes the the, the book, and uh, it's such a beautiful thing. Um, so I remember when I first, listening is such, giving people the opportunity to tell their story, I think is huge. Um, I know I've been to parties where I've left, thinking I've left feeling kind of disconnected and lonely. And I realized no one asked me a question. There was no one seemed to be actually curious about me. I remember when I first moved to Australia, um, gosh, do I dare say 30, 35 years ago, something like that. Um, when I first moved to Australia, I was invited to dinner because I used to be a professional actor uh, earlier in my life. And there was a woman from the church. I first moved to Australia to work at St. Michael's with Francis McDab. And there was a woman in the church at that particular time at St. Michael's whose son was a professional actor at my age and thought that that would be a great way to introduce me into the country and maybe develop a friend. And he actually became one of my closest friends and remains a, a really good friend. So I had just been in Australia for a week and I was at this dinner, so it's still, still kind of jet lagged and tired. And it was just, uh, had such the, the most fantastic time. I was sitting next to this woman who was just delightful. And um, she was delightful and she was just so interested in me. I think she must have asked a thousand questions and just seemed just really curious and fascinated about my life story. And I was just really struck how, how that made me feel, you know, back to valued and valuable. I felt seen, I felt valued. And it was just such a beautiful thing. And I realized I probably didn't ask her very many questions at all. And somebody the next day asked, said, you know, how was your dinner? And I said, I was, I just really, it was great. I just, it was just, it was a wonderful evening. Sat next to this most amazing woman. She had a strange name. Um, Dame Patty. So there I was sitting next to Dame Patty Menzies, the wife of Sir Robert Menzies, and being a typical arrogant idea uh, American who had no idea of Australian history, I had no idea who she was. Um, partly because I didn't ask her any questions. But this delightful woman asked me, a thousand questions and I felt so seen and it was so, uh, it was so beautiful. Um, what are your thoughts on, on just asking questions, being curious, listening? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's, you know, we're talking about something that's gold, you know, it's um, to hear about somebody else's experiences and things you can develop so much more empathy and understanding with or somebody else and understanding their circumstances which you can learn from yourself and add to your own life along the way as well so um 
So just being curious and asking questions, you know, unpacking that that people's stories and understanding what's influenced them, how have they been here today? I mean, I'm a psychologist, so I'm fascinated in these sort of things generally. Um, but I think it just leads to greater understanding, which which leads to greater community harmony, really. So, yeah. I often say uh, transformation happens doesn't happen in headspace where we share opinions and judgments and assumptions. Um, transformation happens in heart space, you know, where we share our stories, you know, rather than, you know, I'm not very into particularly political conversations or even religious conversations. Um, I'm not really that interested in what you believe. I'm interested, tell me a little bit about how you came to believe what you believe. I think that's where the deep connection uh, might happen. I was having a conversation with somebody on guns and, and this person and I uh, have polar opposite views on guns, which is just a huge problem in America. And so rather than get in this fight about, well, here's my opinion on guns, and, uh, and then that person said, well, here's what I think about guns. I asked, tell me a little bit about your story. Um, you're really passionate about, uh, you know, you hold your view on guns really passionately. What are some of the life experiences that you've had that have led you, that have shaped this view? Now, we walked out of the room. I don't think we've, we were, you know, we necessarily changed our opinions. But I felt a deeper connection with this person. I'm pretty confident that some kind of dialogue will continue. Um, so those questions are so important. And also asking interesting questions rather than closed questions. Like, inter you know, questions like, you know, what would you do if you weren't afraid? You know, what for you makes a good day? Um, tell me about your favorite unimportant thing about yourself or with this five years of your life this particular five-year time span of your life if it was a book what would its title be i mean whatever whatever those questions might be that will take us from the surface you know what we think about the weather or our favorite footy team or the cricket score from yesterday to something deeper because i really deeply believe that people have have a strong longing and desire to go deep i really believe that nick epley is a social psychologist uh out of chicago not northwestern but out of chicago and uh, he did a study on the commuter trains he noticed on commuter trains going into the city to work everyone without exception had it had some kind of scream in front of them there was no conversations no connection um, so he hired some people just to go onto the train, sit next to people and try to engage in conversations, ask questions, but not open any questions, interesting questions, questions that would allow them to tell their life story. And then Nick Epley would interview these people unknowingly, um, when they got off the commuter train, how was the ride? And almost without exception, all of them said, oh, no. that was a, one, of the best, one of the best rides to work that I've had in a really, really long time. Why? Because someone asked, uh, asked them to tell a little bit about themselves and, and their story. But to do that is the next L, is we kind of need to lower our armor. You know, we need to allow ourselves to be, to be vulnerable. Um, I often say it's it's not our strength that connects us. It's our vulnerability. But yet what we do is we we present to each other, you know, I'm going to present to you my strength because I want to impress you. But it's really our vulnerability. I mean, the one thing we all share in common is is for example that every single one of us without exception is has experienced heartbreak. That's what we share in common. But we protect, we keep that protected. And instead, what we do is we present, you know, our armor. Um, 
there's this uh, Vivek Murphy, the Surgeon General of the United States. He wrote this book on loneliness. And he talked about his own feeling of loneliness. And, and, and from his book, he said, I was struggling to figure out how to build community. And he was at a retreat. And, and two friends of his, two colleagues, long-term colleagues, were at the retreat as well. And they decided to take a walk together. And so here these old friends were kind of reconnecting. And they realized, he realized all three of them, professional people, successful people, they felt lost and lonely. So at the end of their walk, they, they said to each other, you know, we need to get together more often. I can't even, I couldn't tell you how many times I've said that. Knowing it's not going to happen. And, uh, and he said, you know, we all kind of felt that. So we decided to change that. We decided to make a commitment to be there for one another. And he said he modeled it off the Okinawa concept of Moai. And the, this concept of Moai from Okinawa in Japan is this notion from a, a young age that there's a group of people, a group of friends that have your back. There's at least two people, even outside of your immediate family, there's at least two people you know who will be there for you. So, so Vivek Murphy said, we decided to build our own Moai to make our implicit friendship be more explicit. So they just committed, just made a simple commitment to do a video conference because they all lived in different places in the United States to do a video conference once a month where the purpose was to simply talk to each other about things that really matter. Again, in America, one in five people say, I don't really have anybody to talk to about the things that really matter. You know, so they decided to talk to each other about those things that particularly men <laughs> don't normally uh, talk to each other about. So what he, um, what he remembered feeling is um, that he really loved these guys. But once they made this commitment to talk to each other and to, to lower their armor, to connect at a, a deeper level, he discovered they really, uh, they experienced a connection that each of them would describe uh, really profoundly impacted and changed their lives. Um, I meet once a week, in fact, tonight, um, I have a men's group that I'm part of, uh, five guys. And we gather and our agenda is each person um, is to simply say three feelings, um, meaning right now I feel these three things. And then we let the conversation go wherever it will go. Um, and it's been amazing. Um, we always talk about there's something about this group that's different and, and that is a grounding um, that helps us in the rest of our lives. It's a safe space that we can go to lower armor and feel seen at, at a really, really deep level. So I think we all need our Moai, whatever that Moai is. Uh, those people that we can lower armor with. Does that make sense? What do you think, Catherine? No, it certainly makes sense. And I think that, you know, to be open to being vulnerable, it can be risky for people. And so it's interesting talking about your men's group, that it therefore takes courage to be open with your feelings and your emotions and your vulnerabilities. And so, and having courage um, to have conversations and, and to open up is, is so important and has been shown to sort of increase someone's, um, you know, the, the, just their general strength, you know, their ability to have, you know, authentic conversations because you're saying how you're really feeling and being vulnerable. And, but it can also help with um, self-acceptance as well because you're saying out loud how you feel. And if you're in a safe space, people will accept that. And um, 
And I think with that comes feelings of contentment and things which is also really important. So I think that men's group sounds very interesting and a really good role model. Yeah, and it's really beautiful where, I mean, it is a risk to uh, to reach out. One, to say you really need something like this. Um, we have one rule, and and the rule is not to fix. Um, the rule is just to be present. So it's also a really vulnerable thing to kind of share. This is, you know, I'm feeling, uh, you know, I'm feeling really overwhelmed. It's been a busy week. Um, feeling whatever it might be. And then oftentimes there's just silence. Um, so they're not jumping in to say, well, here's here's what I'd suggest or here's what I'd do. And it gets back to one of the earlier points that deep down the soul just needs to be seen. And there's something really healing in that. So I really encourage those who might be listening uh, who might be part of your Moai and to take that risk like Vivek Murphy did of just with a couple people saying, Hey, let's just commit to meeting regularly. Um, and just connecting at, at a deep level. Cause I know when I've ever invited anybody to tell me a bit of their story, I've never had anybody say, ah, oh, that's none of your business. I've always had people almost surprised, but then really delighted to be able to lower their armor and share a little bit about their real self. So I think some people might kind of put up that defense to begin with, but I'm convinced deep down it's a need uh, that all of us have. Uh, you know, another point, another L that we need to recognize is just the importance of, I'm talking about Moai as kind of a big thing, um, but don't underestimate the little things, you know, don't have, underestimate just the little moments in everyday life, just to recognize people, you know, you might be at the store, take a moment, take a moment, you know, to see the clerk and go, wow, just a really, what a really busy day. Um, you know, must be overwhelming to have to deal with people you know, one after the other, after the other like that. Um, I really appreciate that you're able to keep smiling uh, in the midst of all of that. How do you do that? Notice like open-ended question. One, you recognize, wow, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people here today. This must be a challenge. You know, how do you keep that smile on your face in the midst of that? Well, it's just a little thing where that that clerk will feel seen. Stephen Covey says, relationships are a whole lot like banking. You either make deposits or withdrawals. And the trust that you feel in life, the trust that you feel in any relationship is the status of your account. And he says, withdrawals are inevitable. They're a part of everyday life. There are always, there are always withdrawals. What we don't do is recognize the, the little moments and opportunities to make deposits. Um, so what do you think about the importance of the little moments? I think the little moments are critical because they're the building blocks of your day. And, um, and it reminds me of a story um, back home where two doors up from us, um, sadly, um, an elderly couple, one, one of the partners, he, he they died and um, they had one of the largest funerals in the area. Um, they were a very popular family. They had over 700 people come to the funeral. And a couple of weeks later, I said to my mum, like, how, how, um, you know, how, how are they going up, you know, the, the neighbour up the street and um, the new, the new widow and, um, and she said, oh, I haven't been up there. And my mum looked quite intimidated and she said, I don't know what to say. And I said, Mum, you don't need to say anything. There's probably nothing you can say that's going to make her feel better at this point in, you know, with what she's dealing with. But perhaps you could just go and knock on the door and say, you know, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. So it's sort of speaking a little bit to your point, Stephen. 
And then back to your point about not feeling like in your men's group that you have to fix something. Um, but just let people know that you're present and you're there. And that's enough. Yeah. So my mum did do that. She went up and she knocked on the door. She was the first person who knocked on this person's door in two weeks. Because I dare say a lot of people were feeling intimidated that I don't have a magic wand. What 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 do I say? How can I manage this moment effectively and, and all be okay? And um so mum was really pleased that, that she went and um and the conversation and the support flowed from there and um and broadened certainly. So but it was a reminder how much those little things are important and you don't have to do big outstanding things, you know, um, to make something worthwhile. It's just the small things can count and they build during a day. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, it kind of relates to the the last L, you know, it's to look, you know, to listen, to um, remember the the little moments and I'm, rem I'm forgetting the third one. It's about the armor. Thank you. It's a teamwork. Uh, I just feel seen. Thank you. Um, to lower the armor, um, the little moments, but also, you know, it's really about lifting each other up. Um, sometimes knowing that you don't necessarily have to say anything, just being there uh, and lift another person up. I often say there are, um, there are diminishers, and there are illuminators. And, and diminishers just have a way of, of somehow, I know I've been in situations where I just, I don't feel seen. I mean, I feel ignored or uh, the party I mentioned where no one asked me one question. Um, no one seemed curious. But then there are illuminators who just have a way of, of helping you feel respected and seen and 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 lifted up there's a story of the seven-year-old girl in school and and the teacher um said to her one day you're really good at thinking before you speak and and the seven-year-old girl took what she had considered a weakness her awkwardness, her shyness. And this teacher saw that, but, but turned it into a strength. And, and just, just that statement, parents of the seven-year-old said, turned her whole school year around. Um, she felt seen and she felt illuminated. And that's so powerful uh, that we can do that. Um, I want to finish with a, with a picture, if, if I might, that I think is about illuminating. Um, and it actually takes place in Melbourne with fairy penguins. And this picture was an award-winning picture taken by a photographer by the name of Todd Baumgartner. And he took this picture of two penguins, fairy penguins, comforting each other, watching the, the dancing city lights of Melbourne in the distance. Now, apparently from those who, who, I don't know what you call them there, uh, we would call them park rangers uh, here in America, but people who are in that particular area who observe and watch, the white penguin, uh, the shorter white penguin, apparently is an elderly female who they said was widowed and was all alone. And the taller, darker penguin is a much younger male who also lost his partner and was all alone. And the people who, who take care of this area and were observing these fairy, fairy penguins for weeks, what they said is these two penguins somehow would find each other and they would meet regularly to watch the dancing city lights of the city together, comforting each other in their grief. I just think that's such, in other words, lifting each other up. You know, their connection was in their vulnerability and they lifted each other up and they comforted each other. And I couldn't help but think to myself, that's the world I want to live in.
that's the community I want to be part of. And that's the community kind of community I want to help uh, create. Um, do you have any closing thoughts, Catherine? Um, yes, and that they are beautiful photographs, Stephen. I'm glad you brought them to our attention and things too. I think perhaps there's a little bit of a call for action at the end of this um, discussion. Maybe sometimes moving into the future where we find ourselves at parties, maybe find someone who's not like us, who's a bit different, and um, and have a go and, and take a risk and, and be courageous and, and just sit with them and, and unpack their story and, and talk to them. Um, just as a bit of a call for action, I think, a bit of a challenge and to see what happens and what we learn. You know, I love that because one of the best, best things to realize is one of the best ways to deal with your own sense of disconnection, your own sense of loneliness, is to reach out, <laughs> take the risk. It's hard, but to take that risk and connect with somebody else who perhaps is dis disconnected and lonely. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks. And as always, thank you for this conversation and thank you for the opportunity. It's always a delight to connect with you. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. And likewise, and, and thanks to our audience too for, for listening in. One thing that we do like to know, and that is how, how are we going with these conversations and things too? So we would like and appreciate hearing your feedback um, on our survey. Your answers are collected, they're anonymous. Um, and that helps us improve these sessions. And if there's any topics that you would like to know in the future, please also let us know. And you can see that um, Stephen's email address and my own is also on this slide if you wanted to make contact with us personally. And one thing that I, we always generally close with also is that just to recognise another legacy of, of Dr. Francis McNabb was the creation of the Big Tent, which has been running now for over 30 years, which is really showing the, the need of working and supporting with people who are supporting working families and, and children who are experiencing trauma, abuse and neglect. So if you'd like to help this program, we've certainly got a QR code here um, to provide support to the Big Tent. So there's no need to donate money, but we do ask you that um, to consider donating money, money if you feel comfortable to do so. And 100% of all funds provided go directly to the services that we provide working with children. So next month, our, our next discussion is healing our emotional pain. So, um, so that will be made available in early April. And I really look forward to tuning in and, um, and hearing everybody's feedback. So thank you again, Stephen, and um, and we look forward to you all joining us again very soon. So thank you. Have a great, great month. Thanks. Thanks.